Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. It is so good to be back with you today. I want to start today just with a, a heartfelt thank you to Ray for really stepping up for me last week. I was feeling bad all day on Saturday last week, and I was like, okay, I can fight through this, I can fight through this, but Saturday evening, I just realized I don't think I'm going to be ready for tomorrow, and so I contacted Ray, and I was like, man, can you, can you do this for me tomorrow, and of course, he said yes, and uh, just want to thank him for doing that, I know that was, uh, that's tough, taking somebody else's material, yeah, let's give him a hand. Been allowing God to use him to just to speak truth, and so uh, love having a man like Ray to work with. So, yeah, it's good. It's a good guy, isn't he? <laughs> so, as we are coming out of our "I Am Springdale" series, that was really about becoming disciples and making disciples. It's no coincidence that we are entering into this new series that we're titling "The Struggle Is Wi- Is Real." Uh, Because it's a series on relationships, and what we need to understand is we become disciples and we make disciples through relationships. That's, That's how it happens. God didn't design the character formation process to happen outside of relationships. Relationships are actually the training ground for becoming like Jesus Christ. Uh, How many of y'all discovered that the training ground was your own home this week in your relationships as you are trapped in the house. You know, God's got a sense of humor, doesn't he? He's like, okay, I'm going to trap all of Springdale. They've been saying, yeah, we are Springdale. We're, we're going to become disciples and we're going to be like Jesus. I'm going to trap all of Springdale in their homes for a week with each other and see what comes out. When, when we bumped into each other this week, what was, what was coming out of our hearts? You know, we miss, some people might say, ah, oh, I hate it, I miss my discipleship group this past Wednesday night. No, it just changed locations, all right? Your discipleship group met in your living room every single day. It met in your kitchen, it met in the bathroom, it met wherever you were in relationship with other people. And what we need to realize is we, we just know discipleship happens in the classroom. That's, that's where we learn the truth. But true discipleship, becoming like Jesus, happens in relationships. How are we responding and reacting and loving like Jesus in real life? That's where it happens. From the very beginning, God looked at man and he said, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for us to try to do this on our own. And so he put us in relationship with each other. We were created to be in relationship with him and with others. So if relationships are so important to God, what do you think Satan is going to come after in our lives? Our relationships. Yeah, wherever God is working, wherever his purposes and plans are, that's what Satan is going to come after. And you know what his strategy has been since the beginning? I want to deceive. I, I, I want I them to buy into the lies, the half-truths, the, the stuff that the culture, the world has to feed you. I want you, I want to deceive you, and then I want to divide you. And then once you're divided, I can take you down. I can take you down. Deceive, divide, and conquer. He wants to destroy our marriages, our families, our friendships, our church unity. Anywhere God is trying to accomplish his purposes, that's where Satan is going to attack. That's why we feel like this series is so important because we are in a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual battle. The struggle is real. How many of y'all have ever felt that? The struggle is real in, in more ways than one. But even though the struggle is real, so is God. So is God. The power of God that is at work in our hearts and lives if we will allow him to do what only he can do. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be covering some relationship topics. This week, we're going to try to define love in biblical terms. And in doing so, we're going to discover that love is actually more than a feeling. How many Boston fans we got out there today? 
man, not that many. I thought there'd be, um, thought there'd be some more. Boston, if y'all don't know about this, if y'all, some of you younger people, there used to be something called albums, all right? And Boston had the most amazing album artwork. I just remember pulling out all those Boston albums and just be like, man, because I'm an artist myself, this is the greatest album artwork I've ever seen. And then put them on, listen, it was the greatest. But we're going to discover today that love is more than a feeling. Next week, our topic is going to be how to deal with difficult people. Anybody got any difficult people in your life? Okay, now a few more hands that time. So how do we deal with those people in our lives in a loving Jesus way? Then in week three, we're going to address the topic of picking up the pieces. Sometimes relationships are broken. They don't make it. And so after broken relationships, how do we deal with those unresolved, lingering hurts? How do we forgive? And so that's going to be week three. And then finally, We've got a message titled, For Better or Worse. For Better or Worse. We're going we're gonna to end the series with a challenge for our messages. Remember, that's what we said when we took our wedding vows? For better or for worse. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with the worst stuff, right? But what happens when we're in this worst part? How do we deal with that? How do we, how do, we do it God's way? So I want us to start today by talking about love. And I want to start with a question. When you think of love, what comes to your mind? What is it? What is it? What's the image that pops in your mind when you think about love? Ray? Okay. Hopefully that's just Nelly, but uh, <laughs> is, it a, is it a movie? Is it a song? Is it a person? Is it, uh, what, what, is it that you, what is it you think about? Is it, is it chemistry? You know, is it just these chemical reactions that happen in our brains? Is that what love is? Is it infatuation? Is it physical attraction? Is it a Hallmark movie where it happens in two weeks? Two weeks time is all it takes because this high-powered executive that worked in New York City, she, she lost her job and she had to move back home to the town, this little small town that she grew up in. And you know what? She stumbled into this guy that she used to go out with in high school one day in the coffee shop. And they started talking. They struck up this conversation. And in this conversation, they realized, oh, no, the retirement center is about to be shut down. So we've got to join forces. We've got to join forces. We've got to save the retirement center. And you know what? I, I think the best way to do that is let's have a bake sale. Let's make some cookies. And so they're making cookies together, and they reach over, and they, oh, they accidentally touch hands while they're making cookies. And they fall in love. And th yeah, we've seen that one, haven't we? And, and, and that's the end, right? They, they, they might kiss, but there it is. There's, is that what love is? A Hallmark movie? Is it, y'all like that one? <laughs> it's a good one. Is it, is it out of our control? Is it something that's out of our control, right? That we just, somehow we fall into it, but just as easy as we fall into it, we can fall out of it. I mean, is that, is that what it is? Is it out of our control? Is it some emotional response? Or is it a choice, or is it all of the above? Is it all these things? Just kind of a combination of all these things. Love is hard to define, isn't it? And what makes it even more difficult is in English, we only have one word for love. Just one word for love. Su such, a, such a huge term, such, such a profound term, and we've got one word for it. I love God. And I love steak. Wait, wait a minute. How, how, how are these? Uh, I, I love my wife and I love Whataburger. I, 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 love, I love coffee. I love my church family. I love lamp. How, how do these, how do these things, like th there's no way that all of these, these ways that we use love, they can't mean the same thing, right? There, there's no way. That in all of these contexts, they mean the same thing. So what do we mean by love? How can all of the nuances of love be captured in that single term? Well, luckily in the Greek, they weren't 
kind of stymied by just one term. They had several terms to describe love. Let's look at a few of those as we get started this morning. One of them, the first one, was uh, a Greek word called storge, okay, storge, and this was probably the most frequent term that the Greeks used for love in their language, and it referred to the love that we have for our family members. How many of y'all love your family members? Sometimes, right? Yeah, we, we love our family members, especially this term was describing the love between a parent and a child. I didn't realize, I mean, I knew some of what love was, but when we started having children, I discovered a whole new world of what love means. This love that between a parent and a child that we have for our kids. And I have heard that it even doubles when the grandkids come. Is that right? Like that, and that's a whole nother level of love. But that's a very, uh, a great word to describe this love between family members. Now, they had a different word for the kind of love between close friends. All right? Not family members, but, but close friends. And that word was phileo. I think we've heard of this one, right? The, where we get our word Philadelphia, brotherly love. It's not romantic love, but a commonality, a compassion, a closeness. I like this definition, a deep emotional connection that you only feel with very good friends. Right? We know that kind of love. We've, we've experienced that kind of relationship, that deep emotional connection that goes beyond acquaintances or casual friendships. This is, this is brotherly love. I feel like you're a brother to me from another mother, right? We're, we're that close. I have that type of love for you. But here's, here's the thing. Aren't we reluctant sometimes in those relationships to say I love you to that person because it feels weird maybe? Have y'all ever been there? Like y there's this, this close friendship bond, but with all of the stuff that we think about when we, when we say the word love, we're like, eh, I don't know, it's kind of awkward to tell that person I love you. But we need to do that with those people in our lives. We need to tell them I love you because it's true. Then there was the word, the Greek word, Eros. Now, this is the one that we, I already heard a, a little laugh at this one. This is the one we are obsessed with. This is the one that our culture is obsessed with. This, the Greek culture was obsessed with this term. Songs and movies and books are all dedicated to this subject of passion and sexual attraction, romantic love between a man and a woman, this longing, this feeling that we have for someone else. Now, here's a quick word. Eros love was created by God, all right? This is a good gift that he gave us to, to creation. In fact, the entire book of the Song of Solomon is dedicated to eros love, a celebration of sexual expression. Now, hear this part, within the marriage relationship, within the marriage relationship. But here's what the world and Satan does. They take a good thing, this gift that God has given us, and what do they do? They distort it. And they twist it, and they turn it into, into lust, and they say, pursue it outside of this relationship that God has designed specifically for this type of love, the expression of this type of love. Don't wait for that. Don't do, you can chase it whenever you want it. And we've turned it into lust, and we've sullied it. Romantic love is designed by God for marriage. And it should be pursued in ways that please the Lord. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. But here's another danger for us. For many of us, it becomes the only thing. It becomes the only thing. When it's not the only thing, it's a good thing, but not the only thing. Love is more than a feeling. Which brings us to our fourth Greek word for love. It's one that they actually didn't use very often at all. And it was the word agape. Agape was different, and it's the word that we find for love in our New Testament. It's the word for love that is used to describe 
God, the love of God. So let me try to explain agape maybe a little differently to you this morning. How many of you want to be loved? How many of you want to be loved? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if we're honest, every single one of us wants to, wants to be loved. We want to have someone who will stand up for us and believe in us and care for us and, and hold us. The problem with all of, of these things is that so much is dependent on our desirability, okay? I want you to stick with me. Stick with me for a minute. If we look good, if we are sexually attractive, if we behave a certain way, if we act a certain way, if we can maybe meet certain expectations, maybe, just maybe, others will approve. Maybe they'll love us. But I've got to somehow live up to all of these things, these ideals, these expectations that the world has put on love. But wouldn't it be great to be loved just for being me? Just for being me. Just, just as I am. Even if someone knew everything about me. Even if they knew, you know what? I'm pretty messed up, actually. And they knew that. And they still loved me. This is where agape the love of God comes in. Listen to Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Very few people will die to save the life of someone else. Even if it is for a good person. Someone might be willing to die for an especially good person. But Christ died for us while we were still sinners. And by this, God showed how much he loves us. I'm going to go out on a limb and say there aren't many of us who would die for somebody else. I don't know about you, but if I had to make a list today of people I would die for, that would, that would be a very short list. That would be a very short list. Maybe, maybe a parent for a child. Or you might take a bullet for a very close friend. Or in a storybook romance, you might be willing to die for them. But it would have to be extraordinary circumstances. It's, it's not normal to do that. It, it would take great love to die for someone else. But what if that person had betrayed you? And maligned you, abused you, cheated on you. Would they still be on your list? Would you die for them then? It would be almost unthinkable to do that. Yet, that is exactly the way that God loved us. He loved us while we were still sinners. In spite of our rebellion against him, he loved us knowing every bad thing about every single one of us. And he loved us. That's what agape is. That's what agape is. It's not dependent on the recipient. It's not dependent on how lovely or lovable or how worthy we are of that love. Agape love just loves. It's outrageous. It's not natural. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Agape. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. What kind of love is this? Who would do that for somebody else? Show that kind of love. It's not natural to love someone who doesn't love you. 
It's not natural to give your very best when you could get by with a lot less. It's not natural to love someone who doesn't even care. It's not natural to give everything when there's absolutely no guarantee that you will receive anything in return. Yet this is how God loved us. This is the love that God has for us. He showed us by his actions. By his actions. Not like the person who says, I love you, and then behaves in a contrary way. We've had those people in our lives, haven't we? I think we've all been hurt by people like that. People who have said, I love you, but it's just words. It's just words. There's nothing to it. It's all talk. But God's love is completely different than the world's love. The world says, I love you if you are worth loving. And God says, I love you even when you're at your worst. Even when you're at your worst. I can't get that worship song greater still out of my mind. And I want to encourage you again. To worship around that song. Find it. Listen to it. Meditate on it. God met me at my lowest, at my worst, and I was expecting just complete disappointment. And you know what I found? Love. Love. I I was full of shame. My my, my shame was deep. It was wide. My sin was, was, was... Ugly and horrible. And he's standing there with open arms. I love you. I'm willing to die for you. Even in this state. Even while you are rejecting me and rebelling against me. Because I want what's best for you. The world says, I'll love you if you love me. And God says, I love you unconditionally. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Won't you receive it? Won't you receive it? Agape personified is Jesus. If you really want to know what agape is, read the New Testament. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Study the life of Jesus. Just soak in who he is and be amazed At what he has done for us. His life, his love, his sacrifice on the cross. Agape is radical, sacrificial, self-giving love. It was a love that pursued us at his expense. At his expense. So how do we respond to such great love? What difference does God's love make in our lives? You know what the Bible tells us to do? We take that love that we have received and we give it to others. That's how we respond. We take what we have received. We don't keep it to ourselves. We give it to others. We love as God has loved us. And you know what Jesus says? That's actually the evidence that you're my followers. If you want to know if you're one of my followers, this is going to be the mark of your life. Love. If we agape love one another. This sacrificial giving of myself for the good of others, for their spiritual benefit. Choosing to act in a loving manner, to value the other person, and be devoted to his or her best, regardless of feelings. It's more than a feeling. Agape love is more than a feeling. It's who Jesus is. And it's what it looks like to be his followers. So what does this look like for us in real life, in practical terms? We find the greatest definition for this type of love given to humanity in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Do we know this, know that love passage in 1 Corinthians 13? Yeah. In 1 Corinthians 13, we get a 15-part description because that's who Paul was, right? He was very thorough. We get a 15-part description of what love is. And every single one of those terms, 15 of them, They're all verbs. Every single one of them is a verb. Now, what does that mean? Love is active. Love is 
action. It requires more than words. It's more than a feeling. These descriptions are applicable to all of our relationships. Now, when we think about this passage, what do we normally think of? What's the context that we think of? Marriage, right? Every marriage ceremony, that's, that's when it comes out. But here's the thing. Paul didn't write this to a wedding planner. Paul wrote this letter to a group of believers in Corinth to the church. So the context of this is relationships within the church. If we want to love this way, what does it look like to love this way in relationships as we become disciples and make disciples? Well, let's read it today. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Love will last forever. This type of love lasts forever. So, how do we practice this? What is, again, what does this look like in real life practice? Let's break it down. It is patient. First of all, agape love is patient. How many of us struggle with this one? Amen? Yeah. Amen. This word means to bear up under people's faults and, and offenses, to actually be long suffering. Okay? I'm willing to suffer long to bear up under your mess ups and mistakes and immaturity. I'm willing to be patient with you. I'm willing to wait because I know God's at work in your life. I love this. I shared it a couple of years ago. This, this quote, it says, patience is more than just waiting calmly in a line. It's waiting calmly when people are out of line. When people are or out of line? How am I responding in those relationships? Patience is love for the long haul. It's bearing up under difficult circumstances. It's allowing people to grow up spiritually, realizing, you know what, we're all in process, and we're going to mess up, and we're going to make mistakes, and I'm willing to bear with you as you grow up spiritually, to allow you to make those mistakes without giving up and without giving in to bitterness. And aren't we glad that God shows us this kind of love and patience? Wow, that's what he shows us. And so we receive this and we share it with others. Love is kind. It's gentle and mild and merciful in our responses. How many of you were gentle and mild and merciful in your responses this week as you were trapped in your home? That's not fair, is it? That's not where decide. I mean, come on. I, I, can, I, I'm, I can do that when I'm in my class on Wednesday nights, but in real life, that's a little more challenging, isn't it? You know, kindness is very much like grace. It treats people better than how we think they might deserve to be treated. And again, that's because it's how God has treated us. What's going to be my response? What's going to be my response? It's a sweetness. Ray shared a, a definition with me on Friday. A sweetness of temper that puts others at ease. Proverbs 15, 18 says, hot tempers cause arguments, but patience and kindness brings peace. It brings peace. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. When you love God's way, there's no room for being over-possessive or over-protective, for bragging about yourselves, for flying off the handle, being harsh, abrasive, or mean with each other. Can you imagine, here's, here's a, a scenario, can you imagine Jesus being any of these things? Then why do we feel like we can get away with it? If we're his followers, if, if, if we claim to be in him, we're living the same life that Jesus lived, 
So don't we want to look like Jesus? Can we imagine Jesus responding this way? When we show these traits, we're declaring a discontentment with ourselves, our situation in life, and what we have. Anger, jealousy, and pride, these reactions actually create wedges in our relationship. When God's trying to bring us together, and these reactions actually create wedges. Because we're focused inward. We're more concerned with ourselves than others. And agape love, you know where the focus is? Others. It's focused on others. Love doesn't demand its own way. Agape love is not self-seeking. It's not self-focused. You know, when you live with self-focus, always focused on my rights and my entitlements, we can actually see people as coming into our lives to fulfill our needs. Okay? That's how, we, that's how I view people. You're only in my life to take care of my needs. And when my needs aren't being met, guess what? I get angry. And I get defensive. And I start demanding my own way because you're not living up to what I'm looking for. Because that's the purpose of your existence for me. To make me happy. You want people to play their part. And if they're not, you're angry and irritated that they're not delivering. You know what selfishness is? I better reevaluate this relationship because I'm not getting much out of it. Love says, I'm not here to insist on getting my own way because ultimately I'm here to serve and not to be served. I think Jesus said that, didn't he? In Mark 10, 45. Even the Son of Man, even God in human flesh did not come to be served. If, any, if anybody deserved to sit back and be served, it was him. And he didn't come to be served, but he came to lower himself, to humble himself, and wash the feet of everyone. Love is not irritable, easily angered, stirred up, triggered. That's the word today, right? It's not easily triggered or provoked. Again, because self-centeredness sees the world primarily through the lens of what it needs and wants, it's quick to get angry when you don't fulfill its desires. But agape doesn't respond this way. Agape is willing to tolerate imperfections, think the best of the other. Agape love absorbs and overlooks it's not, it's not nitpick. Every little thing it overlooks and it quickly forgives. And that leads us to love keeps no record of being wronged. How many of y'all have got that mental scoreboard in your heads? For certain people, certain situations, certain relationships, and you're keeping score. Every single time they do something, there's another one. Let me add it to the list. Let me add it to the list. And you think about it and you replay it. And that is your understanding of who this person is, this scoreboard. And when you're angry and when you're upset, what do you do? Let me bring it out and let me repeat back to you all the things that you've done to me. This list that I have of all of the wrongs that you've committed against me. And agape says, we can't do that. If we want to love like Jesus, we can't do that. We can't live that way. When you hold the past over someone, who's in the elevated position? I am, right? I've got power over you. This is, this is my bargaining chip. I'm over you. Is that what love is? Does that sound like love to you? I mean, is that what love is? Is that the love that Jesus showed us? Jesus humbled himself and he forgave us and washed our sins away as far as the east is from the west. They're no more. They're no more. Love requires us to forgive. Love rejoices whenever the truth wins out. It never gives up never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Do you hear that? Every circumstance. 
Love never gives up hope for this person, never stops believing in who this person could be, who God created them to be. See, God doesn't make mistakes. God creates masterpieces, and he's at work in all of our lives and in all of our relationships, and every single one of us is in process. Love never stops recognizing that creation that God has made. Never gives up hope of what God can do in their lives. I have hope. I have faith. I'm going to endure this because I have hope in what God can do in this person's life. There's nothing he can't fix or redeem or heal. There is still hope for this person, this relationship, and love believes those things for them. Love always protects. In the NIV, it says love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Four times. Four times. You think he wants us to hear that word? Always. 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 Not just when I feel like it. Not just when it's easy, when it's convenient, when the feelings are there. I got I to gotta feel a certain way before I can do this. That's not what he's saying here. That's not what agape is. It's unyielding. It's tenacious. There aren't qualifications. We don't put qualifications on this type of love. We don't just decide this is only for a few select relationships in our lives that deserve this type of love. It is applied across the board in our relationships. In our marriage, with our kids, with siblings, in our, in our church relationships, at school, with our co-workers, with our boss. It is applied across the board in relationships. Love doesn't give up, doesn't throw in the tower, doesn't walk away. It bears up under difficulty. It weathers the storms. It gives the benefit of the doubt. I'm not focused on what's behind me. I'm not looking backward all the time. I'm focused on moving forward. What does God have for us right now and moving forward? When you love someone, you patiently endure the wounds of their selfishness and immaturity. That's a tough one, isn't it? Enduring with patience, their immaturity and selfishness. You know that real change takes time, and you're here for it. Even if I'm the one having to do a lot of the work right now, I'm willing to love this way because this is the love that I've received from God. It, it doesn't even have to do with how lovely or worthy the other person is. Agape is about the love that I have received from God flowing naturally out of me into the lives of others. Love requires us to do everything in our power to protect and guard the relationship. Because love will last forever. Now, let me give a disclaimer this morning. Don't try this at home. Don't even bother. Don't leave here today and try to love people this way. Because you can't do it. It's impossible. It's not natural. It's supernatural. Only with God's help, only with the filling of his Holy Spirit can we love this way. Don't go try to manufacture this. Well, I, gotta, I guess I got to try to be more patient. And I got to try to be more kind. And I guess I got to, you know, stop carrying grudges. You're, you're going to lose every single time if you're trying to do that in your own power. We got to have God. We got to have his power. Many of us are on empty trying to siphon off and somehow give this love to other people. And we don't have it to give. We can't give what we don't have. So we got to focus on God. How do, we, how do we get this love? How do we let God create this kind of love in our hearts? First, you have to be filled continually, daily, and overwhelmed with the love of God yourself. You, you've got you've to just soak in the gospel. Understand what it is and be saturated with the truth. Of the gospel. Listen to Paul's prayer for the Ephesians in chapter 3, uh, verses 17 through 19. He says, I pray, this is my prayer for you, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power. 
together with all the Lord's people to grasp. He wants them, I need y'all to grasp this. This is my prayer for you. Take hold of it. Grasp it. How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. you got to understand the love that Jesus has for you. This love that passes all understanding and knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Let him just fill you up with his love. That's what we want. To grasp it, to think about it, to meditate on it, to rejoice in it, to thank God for it. And here's the truth. If we're not convinced that God loves us, we'll never be able to love others as God does. Some, some, of us are struggle, some of us are struggling with that. We don't feel like God could love us. We're not convinced. I don't think I'm good enough. And I hope you see that today. He loves you, as you right where you are. While we were yet sinners, he came and he died for us. And he's saying, receive this love that I have for you so that you can love others this way as well. The more we understand and experience the love of God and the truth of the gospel, the more we'll be compelled to give that same love to others. Secondly, how do, how do we get this kind of love? Pray and ask God to empower you to love others. We pray for this kind of love. We, we seek it. We pray for it. It's no secret that it can be pretty hard to love others, right? We, we struggle. We struggle with, with self-centeredness and selfishness. And people do things that bother us and they sin against us all the time. And there are times when the easiest thing to do is to pull back and just say, oh, I'm done with this. I'm done with relationships. It's too much work. It's too messy. It's too hard. I'm giving up on everybody. And I'm just going to separate myself. And that's the way. There it is. There's Satan, right? Let me deceive. Let me divide and then conquer. Now I can take you down. I got you separated. I got you here on your own. Now I'm going to take you down. In Galatians 5, Paul tells us that love is the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of relationship with Jesus. So we pray in relationship for the power of of his spirit to be able to love others as God has loved us. And then third, we take action. We take the steps. We take action. We can't feel like, this is important, we can't feel, we can't wait until we feel like loving. We can't do it. We can't, well, I just, I gotta wait. I, I can't be a hypocrite. I, I'm just a victim. I'm a victim of my feelings. I've got to wait until the feelings are there. No, that's not how agape works. That's not how agape works. We can't wait until we feel like loving, until the other person deserves it. Well, I'm waiting until they deserve it. If Jesus waited until we deserved it, guess where we'd be right now? We'd still be waiting. And we'd be hopeless and, and helpless in our sinful state. And we'd be covered in sin and heading for death, hell, and the grave. We'd still be there. We don't wait until the other person deserves it, is lovable according to our expectations or, stand, or standards. If we do that, we'll never love like God loves. Agape is more than a feeling. We do loving things like serving and giving and forgiving. We don't do certain things like reacting and giving up and retaliating. And the reality is we probably won't feel like doing some of these things in the moment. But true Christ-like love isn't rooted in feelings. That's our mistake. It's not rooted in feelings. Real love always seeks the good of the other person. Let me share an illustration with you I read today as we're closing. I read the story of a young mother who felt overwhelmed and had been battling depression and it seemed like her schedule and demands of her life were too much to handle. She felt like all she did was nag her kids and scold them incessantly. And when she looked at herself, she saw a failure. And in her despair, she just cried out to the Lord. She just cried out. 
And she just went to the Word, and as she spent time reading the Word, she found the answer she was looking for in 1 Corinthians 13, in those first few verses of that chapter. And she said the five words in particular that really leaped out at her were five words, without love, I am nothing. Without love, I am nothing. So she wrote out these words and placed the notes all over her house, on her refrigerator door, on the dashboard of her SUV, at the top of her calendar. She said, I realized the single most important thing I could do was love my family. She said, so I began to live my life by love. I began to run my home on love. It was as transforming as when I accepted Christ into my life. It brought the happiness back into my life and my home. Wow, what an amazing testimony. And do you know what made the difference for this young mom? She made a choice. She made a choice. And it wasn't always the easy choice. But it changed the whole dynamic of her home and the way she saw herself as a mother and a child of God. Just love. Focusing on love. Acting in love when you don't feel like it is actually a greater expression of love than when you do feel like it. I mean, we know what this is like with our kids, right? Especially the moms. Love is getting up. In the middle of the night to help a sick kid after you've already had a long day and went to bed late. Love is being patient with your spouse when they're irritable. Love is giving a person what they need, not what they deserve. Allowing God to live and love through us. So as we think about just this idea, what is love? What comes to mind when we think of love? I want us to think of it this way. It, First of all, it's a command. It's a command. It's it's the first command. It's the second command. It's the third command. Love me. Love others. Love, Love your neighbor as yourself. Love is everything. It's from God. It's the heart of God, his essence, his nature, his character. 1 John 4, 8 says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Whoever doesn't practice agape doesn't even know God because God is agape. That's what that's, that's what that says in the Greek. It's more than a feeling. It's a choice. It's a commitment to Christ and to others. We are not victims of our feelings. Hear me say that today. You're not a victim. I'm not a victim of my feelings. Even when you don't feel like it, you can choose to do it anyway. Because agape is not about me. It's not based on emotions or pursuing a feeling. I'm seeking the best for someone else. Tony Evans, I love what he said. He says, love, agape love is sacrificial actions for eternal good. There could be no higher purpose. Sacrificial actions for eternal good, for the spiritual benefit of someone else. So the question becomes, what does love require of me? Not what I can get, but what can I give? Because I'm not responding in light of who they are. I'm responding in light of who I am as a, as a child of God. I love because he first loved me. Let me pray for us today.